Hi Haskellings. With yesterday's solution, I wasn't particularly happy with the use of converge on the second part. So today I'd like to replace that with a function called iterate. I'm doing this mostly because I don't think it should be necessary to calculate the entire map if perhaps the element we need from the map is calculated in an earlier stage. Let's have a look at this iterate function. And it's very similar to converge, except it returns a list of a's. And that list is the function f applied to x repeatedly. We can use this to find the first map in our iteration that contains the value we're looking for. So we're going to map across the output of iterate the lookup of the item we're looking for, the shiny gold bag. We're using the safe lookup function exclamation mark question mark which returns us a maybe type. So we use cat maybes which is a function that takes a list of maybe types and returns us just the ones with a value ignoring the nothings. The head of that list should then be the first map which contains the shiny gold bag. We need to import data.maybe for the cat maybes function. That gives us the same result as before. But we're not done. I'd like to generalize this function. And by that I mean we're going to separate out the bag specific parts of this algorithm, leaving just the algorithm behind. So let's copy the function and rename it. And we're going to call it summarize. I'd like to first consider the type signature of summarize. And obviously we need to take in the directed acyclic graph, which is a list of the nodes and their children including the value associated with that edge. Next we'll take in a default value, which will be the value given to nodes with no children. And then a function which will summarize a list of children given the edge value and the summary value for each child. Lastly, we take in the node we wish to summarize. We can remove all references to the bag associated stuff with these generic values. So we replace the value we're looking for with n, the b's there is replaced with dag, and other references can also be generalized. So the b's prime there can be replaced with x's, for example. Okay, so we need to think about how we're going to do the calculation now that we have a more generic version of the calculation function. Firstly, we're going to apply our default value to nodes with no children. Next, we'll replace our calculation with a call to f. But x's here is our list of children as vn tuples, and f takes in vv tuples. So we're going to have to do some sort of mapping over our x's to get the vv tuples. Remember that the two v's one of them is the value for the edge, and the second is the summary value. So we're going to get the summary value by doing a lookup on the map, because that should already be calculated. And then we use fmap to apply that to the second value in the tuple. This is how fmap works for tuples. We still have a compile time error here because we're using n as a key for our map and that requires it to implement the ORD type class. We still need to re-implement the f function in terms of summarize, so let's do that now. Our summarize function takes in our directed acyclic graph, which in our case is simply b's, and then it takes in a default value which for us is zero because a bag which contains no other bags contains zero bags. Okay, then we have the function f, which we'll leave for a second. Uh, then we have the node we're interested in, which is the shiny gold bag. Okay, let's think about the function f. And it's going to do the calculation for us. So let's use our existing calculation function to help us write that. We're given a list of the bags contained by the one in question, so we're going to map over that. For each of those bags, we're given the number of them plus the summary value, which is the number of bags contained by that bag. 
To get the number of bags for that child, we multiply the count of them by the number of bags contained plus one for the bag itself. We sum over all of the children and we should have our total. And that compiles and gives us the same result as before. For day eight, we finally have an instruction set to implement. These are some of my favorite puzzles, and I particularly enjoyed the set of problems last year, which slowly built up the now famous Intercode computer. As always, the first thing we're going to do is use our interact function and parse each line using parsec. We can create an enumeration for our instruction set. This is the ACK, JUMP and NOP operations. And we're going to derive all these things because we're going to use our enump parser from before. Okay, so let's define our parser that's going to parse a tuple of instructions with its operand. We collect the instruction using enump, and then we have a space character. And there's actually in Parsec a space parser called space. Next, we parse the sign of the operand, which is either a plus, in which case we'll return one, or a minus, in which case we'll return minus one. I'm actually going to use a choose here to um, clean up the syntax a little bit. It removes all those parentheses, and we're gonna add a third choice, which is if there's no sign, we just return one. Then we can parse our integer as we've done before. This is going to be a read f mapped over many one digit, just like before. Now let's call the instruction instra, just to give some nicer names. Okay, we're going to return the tuple of the instruction and the sign multiplied by the argument to give the actual argument result. We have created a successful parser that brings in our list of instructions. We get all the writes from there because hopefully we have no failed parsers, in which case we would have a left in that list. And we will create a function f that's going to get our result. We're going to be doing a lot of indexed operations, so we should actually use the data.vector instead of a list for the instruction set. In that case, our main function will have to translate the list into a vector. We should also import our data.vector module as v, because we're going to need some functions, I'm sure, from that library. So our function f is going to have to determine when we have a loop in our program. The easiest way I can think of to do that is to simply execute the program and keep a set of the instruction pointer references that we've already seen. So we're going to create a subfunction exec, which is going to take in the current accumulator value, the current instruction pointer value, and this set. We should first test to see if we've seen this instruction pointer reference before. We create an if statement to see if our instruction pointer is a member of the set. If it is, then we're done. We simply return the accumulator at that point in time. Otherwise, we have to actually execute the next instruction. We use a let to set a few things that we know we're going to use a little bit. So firstly, the new set, which includes the current instruction pointer, and then we increment the instruction pointer. We then fetch the instruction pointed to by the instruction pointer. We use the vector exclamation mark question mark to get a maybe value for that instruction. If the instruction is an ACK, it means we add to the accumulator the value in I. And then we use recursion to execute the next instruction. If it's a jump instruction, then we don't use the successor of IP, we add I to IP instead. And if it's a knob, we do nothing with the accumulator or the instruction pointer. 
We ignore the nothing case, which is when the program tries to fetch an instruction that's outside the bounds of our vector. Let's check our result, and it looks like we have our first gold star. The second part involves changing our program in order to actually get that case where we fall off the end of the program. So we're going to change our function f to return either a left or a right value, depending on whether it terminates or loops. We're going to give it a left value if it loops, and a right value if it terminates. In both cases, it's just going to return the accumulator value. Let's rename this to f prime and create a new function f that's going to change each instruction in turn and then run that program using f prime. There are many ways to do this, but I'm going to make use of the fact that lists are a monad and do this using a do block. We're going to iterate over the index into the program for the instruction we're going to change. We run f prime on the altered program. And to alter the program, I'm going to write a function called map at that will apply the function change to the ith element of the program vector. The function change is going to change a knob into a jump and a jump into a knob. Everything else, it leaves the same. Next, we'll write the map at function. It will take in the index, the change function, and the vector that we want to change. It's going to be a generic function, so I'm going to put this at the top level. We're going to index into the vector using the bang operator, and then we use the slash slash operator to change the value at that index. Let's have a quick look at that. This is the documentation for arrays, but for vectors it's very similar. The second parameter is the list of changes given as a tuple of the index and the new value for that element. As we're only changing one value, we create a singleton list and that contains the index and the new value. The index will be i and the new value will be f applied to that existing value. We fill in the first operand of slash slash as our vector, and that should do it for the map at function. After we apply f prime to our altered program, we get back a left or a right value, depending on whether it loops or terminates. We're only interested in the case where it terminates. However, using let and a pattern match like this will cause a problem if we get a left value. But what we can do is actually turn this into a monadic action that will guard against a left value. We can then return the value a and then take the head of that list to return just the first match. Uh, we have a problem because we didn't set the type signature correctly for f prime, which should be an either int int. And that's compiled. Let's check that value. And we have the second gold star.